I'm about to dissect a case of Grey's Anatomy, but I think I want to do it not just medically. We should do it legally. Welcome to the channel, Legal Eagle. Hey, Legal Eagles. <laughs> Doctors never mean to screw up. Crap, 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 crap is the last thing you want to hear in a surgical room. If I saw a transcript that said, crap, 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 I mean, I would see dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. It's not like we want to hurt anyone, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we make mistakes. I'm... And then the lawyers make it right. I'm sorry. And when we... I'm looking for Dr. Torres. Yes. Hi. Great. You've been sued. <laughs> oh. Is that how it happens? Uh, sort of. In a medical malpractice situation like this, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously have to start the lawsuit somehow. Okay. And the way you do that is called process of service. Okay. And if you didn't know where the person was or where they worked mm -hmm. or you didn't know who their lawyer was, then you would have to hire someone called a process server to actually physically hand you uh, Is that the, the person the like throws it at you and says you, you got, you, you got it served? Can. It can. Because I mean, I've seen that in movies. They, they, they throw it and it's like, oh, I got that served, what does that mean? I mean, you need to have a competent adult who is able to verify that this is the person who is being sued. So throwing it in a door? That is not best practice, okay, no. Okay, Ready to build me a new hip? He needs to be able to do this. See, right there. Can a new hip do that? More importantly, will he be doing it by December? He's got Olympic qualifiers coming up. You mentioned a crash last year? They said it gave me arthritis. You can't win the gold with arthritis. I want the Peterson hip. Would one hard crash cause arthritis for the rest of his young career? It sounds off. The only thing I can imagine is if you have a significant loss of cartilage or potentially a labral tear, but there's other procedures that you can go about from an orthopedic standpoint rather than just replacing the hip. Also, what they're asking of the doctors is not practical at all. To make promises that he's gonna be able to do a move, that uh, promise on recovery time, none of this is ever guaranteed. Because in medicine, you don't even know what's gonna happen until you open a patient up, especially in a specific case. Like This is hyper-specific. He's not a run-of-the-mill joint replacement patient. Right. It's funny you say that because one of the first cases you learn about in law school is called called Hawkins versus McGee. You might have heard of it colloquially because it's called the Harry Hand case, Ooh. where in the turn of the century, a doctor uh, had a patient mm -hmm. who had a, a hand condition. I think his hand was burned. Okay. And the doctor promised that not only would he have a fully functional hand, but it would be 100% uh, recovered. Okay. And uh, he had a skin graft, and as a result, he was not given a 100% normal hand, but a hand that was functional but hairy. Okay. And so the, the lawsuit was, can you recover damages for the breach of the promise that was given sure. when he was promised a 100% normal, normal hand, hand yeah. and given a hairy hand? And the answer is yes, you have to value whatever the difference is in money between a normal hand and a hairy hand. A buddy of mine got this one. He was back on the mountain in no time. <laughs> this is what I need. <laughs> okay, <laughs> even if I did agree that a hip replacement is the right course of treatment, I I've never even used the uh, Peterson resurfacing hip joint. I doubt you or your team want you to be my first. Yes, <laughs> no experience whatsoever barreling forward without yeah. doing the research and making specific promises. This is... A lot of patients in general treat medicine as if it's like a shopping thing. I want the X, when in reality, sometimes X isn't what's best for the patient. And sometimes it puts you in this murky position where the patient feels like they're not getting what they want. You're not giving it to them because you think it's not in their best interest. And then they do something like leave a review for you on one of these websites. And as a result, you can't even comment on that because legally you're breaking patient privacy if you comment on that. Oh, I never thought about that. But yeah. That's absolutely right. I'll research the joint, I'll learn what I can. I'm not making any promises. I'm not worried. I mean, despite the fact that she appears to have been actually making some promises, yeah. it is obviously good that she is going to do some research here. It's not necessarily dispositive that a doctor hasn't done a procedure before sure. and is therefore negligent based on whatever outcome yeah. happens. But often in cases like this, at least the manufacturer has an interest in making sure that their own products are installed correctly. Yeah. So to my knowledge, medical manufacturers will give doctors extensive training so that things are done correctly on, on the user end. They will send in a rep during right. the time of the procedure to be with us and guide us with the questions that we may have. And they're really well trained because a lot of the stuff tech-wise comes out so soon, you just have to have them on the same page. I'm not settling. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you convinced me. Okay. 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 I tried. 
And there are things to remember tomorrow. Let the jury see your face. You wear Wait, a suit. Wait, tomorrow? That's right. What? How fast is that? That's ridiculous. This is a conversation that they would be having on day one, on day two, <laughs> on day three. This would be a multi-year process. Let the jury see your face. You wear a suit. Dark, not Is bright. Skirt, wears? not pants. Minimal jewelry, heels, pantyhose. Pantyhose. Professional, but feminine. You still have your wedding ring? Yes. Wear it. <laughs> Juries respond better to married women with families. Ooh, now, that's a little misogynistic there. <laughs> I mean, so there is there's a whole science to presenting yourself in front of a jury. This is going a little bit crazy in terms of the specifics. I mean, you yeah. want to dress nicely. There, there are whole memes on the internet about um, Takashi6969 showing up to court with like tattoos all over his face, yeah. his tie like down to here, yeah. and like his shirt yeah. out and stuff. So you don't want to show up to court looking like that. Okay. Being so specific about yeah. what you're wearing. She's like a doctor. The She's colors, does it matter? I mean, not, I can't not really. Yeah. Maybe on the extreme margins. You ready? Sure. Okay, okay. As someone who knows a fair bit about men's fashion, okay. what do you notice about the shirt that this guy is wearing? It's a uh, different sure. color, collar and probably cuffs. Yep. So he's wearing what's called a contrast collar and French cuffs. Yes. Which is, if I had to choose the most pretentious thing you could possibly <laughs> wear with a suit, I would say contrast colors. Now, okay. th there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, if uh, you know, you're a tobacco tycoon, maybe, <laughs> and you're drinking a mint julep on a patio, contrast colors, <laughs> great. I believe that there's only one proper color, color. for a shirt, which is white. White, okay. <laughs> but that, it makes shopping a lot easier, yeah. right? An above the knee uh, amputation is usually a more aggressive one. If you can, you always try and go below the knee for stability purposes. Also, there's a lot of blood vessels here that are really dangerous. Mm. So most patients that I see who have amputations, usually to like diabetes complications, gangrene, uh, are below the knee amputations. It's rare for me, at least in primary care, to see above the knee amputations. I imagine you want to save something below the knee so that the prosthesis is exactly. more functional that yep, way. Yeah, exactly. You do rise when the judge comes in. What if I could? So that is great. There's a whole science and pseudoscience to making your client presentable and human in front of the jury. Okay. And you're technically not allowed to talk to the jury except in opening statement and closing argument. Okay. So anything you can do to humanize your client, wow. the better. And notice he's not wearing a tie. Makes sense, and he's a young guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, humanizes him a little bit. But to, to kind of get that jab in and say, oh gosh, I can't stand up because of this horrible thing that the doctor did to me. That's really Driving smart. home the point. Driving home the point. Uh, it's not gonna show up on any transcript anywhere. Oh. Uh, serving as a juror in a medical malpractice case isn't easy. I don't know about y'all, but I'm no doctor. Hell, I've barely made it through high school biology, so. <laughs> okay, fine. But in you general, are going to get a crash family. course education in orthopedic medicine, and post-operative infections. And you're gonna hear words like pseudomonas and emboli. Don't let that intimidate you. So the sort of aw shucks thing, like yeah. I'm not a doctor, yeah. blah, blah, blah. That can be good, but you want to pair that with making the defense seem like they're the ones that are trying to overly complicate things. Got it. And that you're the Speaker of truth. You're yeah. going to tell them exactly what happened because you're not hiding anything. In an opening statement like this, what you would want to say is, you're going to hear a lot of medical jargon. The, the defense wants you to be confused about these things, but you want to transition to your theme. The one thing you want the jury to remember throughout the entire case, the lodestar that they can hold yeah. on to, and, and you say, despite all this complicated stuff, and we're going to explain it to you, the one thing you need to remember is this. Dr. Torres, agreed to perform a surgery she did not fully understand. We will establish that Dr. Torres okay. made a series of faulty decisions eventually costing Mr. Travis Reed, a thriving, healthy Olympic athlete, his legs. And we will establish that all of this started because of one careless mistake. So that's not bad. It's a little argumentative. An opening statement is not uh, like a closing argument, okay. where you're allowed to make whatever arguments you, okay. you want. An opening statement is there so that you can tell the jury what is going to happen, what evidence is going to come out okay. based on you know, extensive sure. discovery that, that you have done. What I don't like about this is that he has 
put the stakes too high. This doctor made one huge mistake, and this doctor did something she didn't understand. If I was the defense you counsel- You just disprove that and he loses. Exactly, yeah. I would say, my, my closing argument, I would say, remember when the plaintiff's attorney said, the doctor didn't understand that. Well, you heard from the doctor that she did 100 hours of research, yeah. corresponded with the manufacturer, and brought the manufacturing rep out to participate in surgery. Yeah. She knew what she was doing. Is it true that in medical malpractice cases, unlike the burden of proof being, uh, being beyond a reasonable doubt, it just has to be more likely than not. That's exactly correct. Okay. And that is the case with all civil cases. Okay. It's called the preponderance of the evidence standard. All right, let's start closing. Irrigation, please. Wait, the sponge count is off. We're missing one sponge. Are you kidding me? We can't close until we find it. So this is true. Uh, we do a very careful sponge count before and after the procedure prior to closing because there have been cases, as you're well aware, of sponges being left in patients, tools being left in patients. In fact, I remember when we were operating, we would have on the wall all the sponges that we have uh, were gonna use for that case. So there would be like 30 sponges on the wall in little pockets, yeah. almost like the shoe things. You right, know? yeah, that makes sense. And then as we take them out, we put them back in. And we've made certain adjustments where before we would just use sponges by themselves. Now they have an attached plastic ring that makes them easier to spot. You could also leave that plastic ring outside of the body so you know to take the sponge oh. out. So there's been a lot of adjustments to improve here but clearly it still happens sometimes. Are you saying that Dr. Torres knew she left a sponge in Mr. Reed's body and she didn't care? No, of course she cared, but- No, but still, she knowingly left- What? Who, who is this she on the stand? Exactly. This is one of the nurses or doctors in the hospital. So the plaintiff, as apparently his first witness, has called a hostile witness. <laughs> Okay. That is insane. Juries, like all humans, yeah. um, have the primacy and latency effect. So they're gonna remember what they heard first and they're gonna remember what they heard last. Yes. So, using that to your advantage, at this point to the sand, you would call either the plaintiff himself to tell the entire sad story of yeah. what happened to him, or you call your expert who is going to explain- On your side. On your side, know. all of the medical stuff uh, from the secondary material. You would never call a witness that is basically on the other side. Yeah. The patient was running out of time. He would have- yeah, Hun, hun, it's a yes or no question. Hun, hun, hun? <laughs> I've got a boy in college, good kid, and I went to visit him last month, and you would not believe the sponge I found in his sink. I mean, there's no television Ask a question. On that Objection. Thing. Irrelevant? Yes. yes, that was irrelevant, but yes. that's like the fifth most important yeah. objection to make yeah. here. He's just telling a story. I got this kid in college. <laughs> He's a real mess. He left a sponge in the sink. The only thing you're allowed to do during examination is ask questions. That's it. Well, let's fast forward to the next time we saw Mr. Reed. About two weeks later. And how was he then? Was he good, happy, recovering well? He had an infection. Hi there. Travis, I hear you got quite the fever. Temps 103, I'm just starting his workup. He's burning up. And she said this is weeks later? Apparently. But weeks later, she's just seeing him for the first time? Like, that, she would that, see him the next day. That sounds negligent. I had to force him to come in. How are you feeling, Travis? Seen worse. Wait, he went home with a fever? No. Post-surgical fever can happen, and there's like a thing that we remember in medical school called the five Ws, wind, water, walking, wonder drugs, um, and they all mean something different, like UTIs, pulmonary embolism is one of them, uh, wind being uh, pneumonia, uh, medications that you could be taking can cause a fever, and you try and rule things out. But the fact that he went home with the fever and he's 103, that's a really high fever. That should be thoroughly investigated. Is that a murmur? Okay, so they are listening to the heart. Travis, <laughs> I'm just gonna take a look at <laughs> listen to the right side. Okay? Well, it's funny, when you listen for heart sounds, you actually listen starting on the right side of the okay. body. And a lot of people, patients that are medically in tuned from watching shows or have some curiosity, they'll say, doctor, you know, the heart's on the left side. <laughs> I'm like, well, there are uh, blood vessels that come off the I heart see. that are on the right side that I we see. listen to as well. Uh, the pulmonary artery, so you wanna listen there and then move your way, make your way aorta, listen to the chambers of the heart. So yeah, we do listen on the right side to hear the heart. That looks bad. Oh, wow. That looks like oh, an infected wow. wound. What does oh wow mean? Yeah, so when we give medical <laughs> feedback, when we listen to a patient's lungs, where we look at wounds, we tend not to exclaim our feelings. <laughs> so we don't say that sounds scary, that's good, that's bad. It's, it's either normal or abnormal, and you keep it at that. I don't want you to worry. The 
The wound looks a little infected, so we're just a little gonna infected. It all out, okay? Yeah. I mean, he looks like a zombie from my eyes. What I'm seeing right here is all kinds of reasons why the hospital could have not only contributed to the initial negligence, but yeah. committed its own malpractice as well, which is that this patient is being sent home too early. Yes. This, this patient is not being checked on regularly. Yeah. And to the extent that they are checking on this patient, they're not examining the wound yeah, where the, exactly. the surgery took place. Yeah. So that wound did not get infected today. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's been an infection that's been festering. And yeah. generally speaking, after you have surgery, you have not only follow-ups with the surgeon, you have follow-ups with your primary care doctor, all of which times we do vitals, we check the wound. In fact, anytime a patient now is hospitalized, we have one of our nurses call the patient the next day to make sure they understand the medicines they should be taking, what symptoms are they experiencing, and if anything is off, they come right back. Well, what about the murmur? Could the infection have traveled to his heart? His vitals are stable, so first we gotta clean out that joint, okay? We can't afford any delay. See, another thing that's uh, untrue. How does she know the wound is not just infected versus the joint is infected? Well, at this point, they might as well just paint a dollar sign on top of the hospital. Exactly. And this doctor might as well be just taking wads of cash and lying Honestly, on I think if you, you can probably create your own law firm that just targets their patients because you'd be very well off. Post-op infections are very common. They happen all the time. Is that your professional opinion? It is. I see. And in your professional opinion, is it also common for a post-op infection to result in a Double amputation, does that happen all the time too? You don't know what she's going to say right there. She might say, yes. in a situation like this, where this went wrong, his heart blew up, his, yeah, he had yeah. a lung problem, yeah, that's exactly what I would expect to see. And these doctors did a fantastic job that's in completely impeccable. What would he have done in that case? Thank you, Your Honor, I have no further <laughs> questions. Why didn't you page me sooner? We just heard the murmur this morning. This morning? Yeah. Look at this growth. You knew he was a heart patient. This didn't concern of you? Of course it did, that's why you're here. So what do we do? The infection is eating away at his graft. So not only is he having a fever because his joint is infected, which she knew somehow without doing any diagnosis, but his heart valve also has an infection on it. Vegetations means it has actual bacterial growth on it. And she's only performing the surgery on his leg, but not on the heart. Dr. Torres, you need to see this. I was changing his compression socks and I saw this. His leg's gray, cold, I can't find a pulse. So Why aren't you gray. checking all the yeah, time? Yeah, exactly. So when a patient is laying in a hospital, they're not just passively laying there. The reason they're in a the hospital is because there are wound checks every few hours, neuro checks. The residents come in and round on the patient every morning, look at the wound, look at the leg. And yeah. it seems like uh, some casual. area where there's already been some problems. Yeah. You probably don't want to hide him behind compression socks. Yes, exactly. Okay, where's Whitney? I told her she had time to grab lunch before Travis woke up. All right, you need to go find her and tell her. That's an ultrasound, portable ultrasound machine that we use to hear blood flow. And the reality of it, you don't need that for his leg. You can see that <laughs> it's not getting circulation. Okay, I've got to go in and do an embolectomy on this uh -uh, leg. No, yeah, I've got to go in and fix it. So an embolectomy, like they're saying that a blood clot has now traveled to his arteries. I can't, I can't even Arteries. follow this. There's nothing, like there's no medical well, sense or that, rhyme or reason. I mean, doesn't that presume that a blood clot has flown down to his arterial system now? In his legs. Yeah, which means it did a full circle. <laughs> His body. He just... If I don't try this embolectomy, he could lose his leg. Well, he can live without a leg. He can't live without a functioning heart. Look, if you do the heart tomorrow, it gives him an extra day on antibiotics, all right? He'll be more stable and the heart surgery will be less risky. Christina, this is Travis Reed we're talking about. Let me try to save his leg. Does the course of treatment change if you're dealing with a famous person? Uh, it doesn't change that, but it does depend on patient need. Like if a patient's job is intimately tied to a specific um, function of their body, we will work harder to save that. Body I body. see. Yeah, so there is some truth to that. You may have seen like musicians play their instruments during brain surgery because they want to make sure they don't do any damage to something that's really important to that Whoa, person. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. Oh, what's his temper? Oh, he was febrile overnight, but his white counts did. Right. <laughs> what's going on? Travis? What aren't you telling me? What's wrong? That's full on necrosis. So here's the weird why, why situation. Why are people checking on him? Yeah. Why is he the one pointing that out? Yeah. And why are they so casually strolling in like in the middle of the day? He's basically throwing more clots. And the fact that they waited to do his heart, I don't, it, it, it's obviously, she's guilty. <laughs> I'm liable. gonna just call it. This is a civil yeah. suit. Yeah. She's not guilty, okay. she's liable. liable. And I think so is the hospital yeah, here. Agreed. And notice where his uh, necrosis was starting from. Below the knee. Below the knee. Why do they go above? Oh man. That's, uh, that's, that's unfortunate. If you want to see the rest of our analysis, click here for part two on Legal Eagle's channel. Check out Legal Eagle.